14th chapter of the book of Exodus, the Old Testament book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus. Exodus 14, we're going to read today verses 10 through 14. I want to talk to us for a while on the topic paralyzed by faith. Amen. Paralyzed by faith. Exodus 14, verses 10 through 14. There it is on the screen. For those in the house of the Lord today that may not have a Bible on your lap or in front of you. Exodus 14, 10 through 14. And the King James text today reads, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today Ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Amen. Paralyzed by fear. If you'll bow your heads one more time. Lord, we always come to you in prayer before the word of God goes forth, as this is the most important and the most essential part of every meeting and every service that we conduct. The Word of God is so powerful. It is able, God, to inspire. It is able to cause faith to spring forth in our hearts. It is able to lift us up, O oh God, when all seems hopeless and our hearts are filled with despair. At this time, God, in our world, things are falling apart. Our nation politically is under attack. Our world today is under attack, God, by a great virus that is sweeping across the nations and causing many to fall ill and many, Lord, even to perish. Master, if ever there has been a moment in time when the people of God need to hear a word from heaven, now is such a time. We need a word from God. We need a prophetic word from the Lord. Oh, Master, fill my lips today with the word of God. Fill my heart, my mouth today, oh God, with that blessed manna from heaven that feeds our soul and nourishes and encourages and restores. Touch the ear, God, the hearing of every hearer. Those listening now, those who will later listen by reason of the internet. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost flow like a mighty river through this place. Touch the speaker and then in turn touch the hearer. Lord, that I might speak a word worthy of receiving and that the hearer might receive it, O oh God, as a word from heaven. We ask all this in none other than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. Our primary text today comes from the story of the Exodus 
of the people of God from the land of Egypt. And it was very early in the Exodus story, for the people of God had just arrived at the banks of the Red Sea. So we know they hadn't gone very far. And the Word of God says that Pharaoh hardened the heart, excuse me, that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that Pharaoh changed his mind about releasing the people of God and he called his armies together, he called his chariots together and they began to pursue Israel as they made their way toward the wilderness of sin. I'm going to tell you today, folks, too many people want to believe that every bad circumstance that comes your way is an act of the enemy. I'm here to tell you as a child of God, the enemy has no power over you. He has no power in your life. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. And God is the one who determines what comes and what goes from your path. The children of Israel were not being pursued by the armies of Egypt because the devil inspired Pharaoh to follow them, but because God caused Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. I'm going to tell you there are times when God wants to show his power, when God wants to reveal himself in your life. There are times when God wants to do something miraculous for you. And we gripe and we groan as the children of Israel did. And we moan and we whimper rather than understanding all things work together for good to them that love God to those who are the called according to his purpose that's the word of God children of Israel started murmuring and complaining they did this the entire time for 40 years that they wandered through the wilderness behind Moses their leader they begin to remember what? Weren't there graveyards in Egypt where we could be buried? You had to carry us out here to the middle of the wilderness so we could die out here at Pharaoh's hand. How many of us approach God that way? How many of us go to the Lord and say, Lord, oh, you know, you must have brought me here for some horrible, terrible, evil purpose. Honey, God don't lead you anywhere for some terrible, horrible, evil purpose. There's not a circumstance that comes into your life that God has allowed to come into your life for some horrible, evil, wicked purpose. And the only thing that can prevent you from experiencing the miraculous and seeing the hand of God revealed in a way you've never seen the hand of God revealed before, the only thing that will prevent a miracle is unbelief. If you remember in the Gospels, the Word of God said concerning Jesus that in certain places, in certain cities, it said, and He could perform no miracles there. What? Jesus lost His power, His divinity. Somehow or another seeped from his pores and fell upon the ground. Why was he not able to perform miracles in certain cities and in certain locations? And the word of God then says, because of their unbelief. I'll tell you, a lot of Christians wind up going through garbage they don't have to go through if they would just learn to let go and trust God. To, if they would just accept the promise of God, if they would understand that God knows what He's doing, the Lord is working His purpose, there is something good to be gleaned from your current circumstance. Let me tell you something. There's something wonderful to be gleaned from this virus right now. There is something good to be gleaned from this uh, terrible 
uh, economic blow that we're experiencing right now. You say, Pastor, I don't see it. Well, you don't have to see it. God sees it. And those of us that live for God and serve God, the Word of God declares, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Right. So whether you see it or not means nothing, means little, so long as you can put your faith and confidence in God. If you can look up toward heaven and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why you brought me to the banks of the Red Sea. I don't know why, Lord, you're allowing Pharaoh and his men to follow with chariots and swords and spears. And here we are, a bunch of poor people. We don't have an army. We have no defense, Lord. We have nothing to protect ourselves. But you brought us out here and you've allowed this circumstance to come about. I don't altogether understand it. But as the old song says, I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. All the children of Israel, the word of God tells us in our primary text today, were full of fear. And you know, there is a natural response to fear. There's this natural inclination that we refer to as fight or flight. You've heard that phrase. Sometimes we watch these Ghostbuster programs on TV, you know, and something will happen or something will appear or something, you know, shows up. And the person who is uh, doing these investigations says, you know, I had a, a fight or flight, you know, uh, response. It was like, I was either going to have to fight or I was going to have to run. And then I've had others, I've listened to others say, I had a flight response. There was no fight in me. The minute I saw it, it scared me out of my mind and I had to run. There is a natural tendency uh, when we are threatened and when something comes against us, there is a natural tendency. We feel like we have to fight in order to defend ourselves, in order to survive, or we have to run and flee the scene. In order to survive. I'm sure a lot of the children of Israel at that moment in time were thinking to themselves, perhaps we should run. Perhaps, perhaps if we separate ourselves from the greater body of Israelites, we can run off into the desert somewhere and hide and find some kind of safety and at least live to see another day. I'm sure they had they might not have had a whole lot of fight in them because they had nothing to fight with but they may have had a flight response but Moses had a word from the Lord thank God for leaders that know how to deliver a word from the Lord I'm gonna tell you I grew up in the Pentecostal church and I know a lot of people who talk about growing up in church and, oh, it was such a negative experience. It was such a bad thing for them. It was so horrible for them. Well, I'm sorry for you because I'm going to tell you a little secret. Even though there were things that were said in the church growing up that caused me discomfort and there were things that were said that frankly caused me a lot of pain and distress at times. It wasn't like they were said every Sunday or every sermon. I'm going to tell you, I grew up with pastors who brought a word from God. And my home life was not wonderful. It was full of a lot of turmoil. If you, if you have never grown up in a home with parents who were constantly arguing and fighting, if you didn't grow up in a home with a father who was unsaved and who only knew how to be verbally abusive and psychologically try to twist you and turn you every which way but upside down, if you hadn't grown up in that kind of a circumstance, then you don't understand the depression and the despair that you experience on a daily basis. 
And Tommy, I'd go to the house of God and my pastor would deliver a word from the Lord and that word from the Lord, I'm going to tell you, it would give me the strength I needed to go another day. It would give me the encouragement I needed to go another week. It would give me the faith I needed to hang on and hold on and keep moving on. And if it wasn't for that, only God knows where I'd be today or if I would be today. So my experience in the church was primarily a very positive experience. And it's because I had good pastors and good preachers who were able to deliver a word from God. I'm going to tell you, the right words at the right time can make all the difference in the world. I believe this message today is the right words at the right time, and I hope that you'll be able to receive it as such. The Word of God declares in our primary text today, Exodus 14 and verse 13, and Moses responds to the fearful people of Israel, saying unto them, Fear ye not, stand still. See, fight that. Fight that desire to run. Fight that desire to flee. Fight that desire today to respond fearfully. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you, show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Listen, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Very few people have not experienced that sensation of being paralyzed by fear. Most of us have at some point in our life, we've been in an ex, uh, a position in a circumstance where perhaps an animal, a wild animal, or a, an animal that wasn't acting right was standing in front of us growling with his teeth bared, and we just found ourselves frozen with fear. We didn't want to move. We were afraid if we moved, we'd get attacked. And we were afraid, you know, the, the, we couldn't even get our muscles to respond. There was that fight or flight instinct, but our, our muscles weren't responding. They weren't listening. The inside of your head was yelling, run, you fool, run, run. But your body wasn't running because fear had taken over and you were by that fear. I want to tell you today, I want you to understand today, children of God need to learn to become paralyzed by faith. When the enemy is behind us and our circumstance looks the bleakest, that's the time when you need faith to take over in your spirit and you need to stand still. Hallelujah. Don't move a muscle. Don't do a thing. Don't run. Don't fight. Don't fear. Don't be afraid, but stand ye still. Hallelujah, Moses said. And see the salvation of the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you, it takes some training. You got to learn to control that fear instinct. I remember years ago, I grew up with a grandpa. My mom's dad, bless his heart. He was not a mellow man. He was very high strung. <sighs> I think he had some mental health issues. Could have been bipolar, depression, I don't know. But he, he had some issues. There were days when... He was wonderful and his moods were good and you could have a conversation with him and all would go well. But then most of the time he was extremely moody and he worked hard. I mean, he worked in a factory 16 hours a day, the majority of his working life. And he'd come home and try to sleep. He had 10 kids. I'm going to tell you, you try to keep 
ten kids quiet. And he'd come out and barking and hollering and screaming at the kids because he needed quiet. Well, you know, kids are going to be kids. And we grandkids were subject to the same thing when we were little. We'd be over at Grandma and Grandpa's house and Grandpa, bless his heart, be trying to catch maybe six hours of sleep, you know, before he had to go back to his next 16-hour shift. And he'd come out just hollering and barking. And, and my Grandpa, bless his heart, he could cuss like a sailor's parrot. I mean, he was rough talking. That's probably one reason why to this day I don't have a very difficult time being around people who talk uh, rough and gruff and use foul language. I do not enjoy it. I do not like it. But I can handle it better than a lot of people can because, you know, I grew up around my grandpa and he was this way. But, you know, my grandfather throughout the course of my relationship with him growing up, he shared a lot of really wise words with me. He really did. He shared things with me that my father never shared with me. I'll tell you that right now. And one of the things that I remember my grandfather saying to me when I was relatively young, he said, when the situation is the worst and you are the most troubled, and you are the most upset, and you're the most fearful, he said that is the time when you need to keep it together the most. He said when things are at their worst, that is when people tend to react, and they react in a way that is wrong. They make the wrong decisions. They respond the wrong way. And it can cost lives. It can cost you your life. It can cost you a limb. It can cost you many things. He said, listen, when things are really wacky and out of whack, he said, that's when you need to keep your head about you the most. Well, you know, the words are easy to hear. But then many years ago, oh, it's been heavens. I was 17 years old. I'll be 55, God willing, in September. I was 17 years old working in a Dairy Queen in the south end of Fort Worth on Miller. And we had a man that used to come into our Dairy Queen uh, almost every day. And they called him China. I don't believe that was his name. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was a nickname. He was, I was told, was either a Vietnam or a uh, Korean War vet. He was a black man. He was very disheveled. He was not dressed well. Wasn't the cleanest man on the planet. Uh, everything in his clockwork wasn't altogether working. He didn't keep time real well, let's put it that way. He was a quiet man, though. He was a peaceful man. He didn't cause us any trouble. But almost every day, Tommy, he'd come in and he'd ask us, can I do something for a meal? Can I do something for a meal? I thought he was homeless till somebody told me, no, he's not homeless. He lives with his sister or something. You know, he lived with some kind of family. But he'd come in and ask us if he could do something for a meal. And our manager was a very sweet lady, very compassionate lady, and and she liked China, and she'd say, sure, China, why don't you sweep up the park a lot for me? And he would. I mean, he'd get out there, and he'd do a good job, too. He didn't just, you know, act like he was doing something. He would do a good job. He'd clean it up. He'd get all the garbage together, put it in a bag, you know. And when he was done, he'd come in, and he'd sit down at one of the tables, and inside his coat pocket, he always had a puzzle book. He'd have these little word puzzles, you know. And he'd put that word puzzle book down and he'd start doing crosswords or he'd start doing word searches and all that. And he smoked like a chimney. Now back in those days, to tell some of you young people how old the preacher is, back in those days you could smoke in a restaurant. He'd sit at the table and he'd smoke his cigarettes and he'd be reading his crossword book and he'd have a cigarette between his fingers like this. And the filter would kind of be up against his head. Well, China used to spray his hair with glycerin to make it all shiny, you know. 
I don't know why, because you should have combed it first. If you're going, if you're going to try to look pretty, at least comb it first. But his hair'd be all disheveled. But he would spray glycerin all over his hair. One day he was sitting there after doing some work and earning a meal, and he was sitting at the table with that cigarette up against his head, and all of a sudden, the ember from the cigarette touched some part of his hair, and his head went up in flames. And when I say it went up in flames, I don't mean like Michael Jackson where some little portion in the back of his head started on fire. That man's head went up in flames. I'll never forget it as long as I live. All of a sudden, I heard one of my co-workers screaming at the top of her lungs. And I turned and I looked at her, and she literally was just standing there screaming. I mean, just squealing at the top of her lungs. And I looked over at Jean, who was the manager. She was standing behind the area where the cook is, you know. And she was standing there. I'll never forget it. She had a look on her face of absolute horror. And she was just frozen, not moving a muscle. And I looked to see what they were looking at, what they were shocked by. And there was China running around the dining room at this Dairy Queen with his head, I mean, fully engulfed in flames. It was one of the most horrifying scenes I've ever seen in my life. And the smell of burning flesh was beginning to fill the air and burning hair. If you've never smelled that, it is a putrid, horrible smell. My first thought was I was able to keep my calm. Grandpa told me when things are at their worst, keep your calm. I was able to keep my calm. My first thought was to get a rag from our, we used to have a bucket with some bleach water and there were rags in it to wipe the tables down and on. I thought, well, my God, no, there's bleach in that and everything. God only knows what that will do to him. And then I looked, and there was a customer standing at the counter. Now, this lady, I don't know, she was just standing there with a coat over her arm. It was wintertime. She had her coat folded over her arm. I went over, and I grabbed that coat off of her arm, and I, I said, China, stop, stop, so I'm trying to get him, because he was running around like a chicken that's head chopped off. And I threw that coat around his head, and I began to pat out the flames with that coat. When I got finished and the flames were out, China went back and he sat down at the table. He was in shock. And you know, the first thing he did was start to light up another cigarette. Well, obviously, we called an ambulance and all that, you know. He lived. I went to see him in the hospital and he, his doctor came in while I was there. I had to put on scrubs from top to bottom. Had to wear a face mask. Had to wear a cap because he was subject to infections from the burns. All the skin that it burned from the top of his eyelids all the way down to the back of the, the nape of his neck had turned pale like white. It was a horrible scene. When his doctor came in, China said, Doctor, this is the man that saved my life. This is the man that saved my life. And the doctor said to me, he said, you really did save his life. He said, if he had burned for even a few seconds more, he said, there would not have been enough membrane of his skin to keep it from literally just falling down over the front of his skull. And I thought, and I said, China, I wasn't even supposed to work today. I mean, that day. I was off that day. The manager called me and asked me if I could come in and work somebody else's shift because they weren't feeling well. I wasn't even supposed to work that day. I said, you know what, China? God is the one that saved your life because I wasn't even supposed to be there. And my grandpa taught me when things are really chaotic and things are at the worst, that's the time when you need to stay calm and stay focused and don't allow yourself to get crazy. And boy, I'm going to tell you, my grandfather's advice, Tommy, was ringing through my mind, literally, as that was happening. I was hearing my grandfather say, stay calm, stay calm. I could literally hear my grandfather's voice, and he was still living at the time. So I'm not claiming there were any ghosts floating around. 
we have a tendency of reacting to circumstances in ways. Look at the one employee. She stood there and screamed. What good did that do? Look at the other lady, the manager, who was a precious woman. But look at her reaction. She literally froze. She was terrified. She froze in place. What good was that reaction? No, as children of God, we've got to learn that fear does not govern us. We are not to be manipulated by fear. For the Word of God declares in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. God has not given us the spirit of fear. When you're feeling fear, it is not coming from God. If it is not coming from God, then it is not serving you well. In Haggai, the second chapter, verse 5, the word of the Lord declares, According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ said that His presence, His power, His Spirit, the Holy Ghost, would reside with us till the end of the world. Honey, you ain't never alone. And if you ain't never alone and God is always with you, then you have no reason to be fearful. Hallelujah. You have no reason to be afraid. Do not be paralyzed by fear. If anything, be paralyzed by faith. I remember hearing the story many years ago of a man who walked out the back door of his home with his rifle in hand and his young son, only three or four years old, was out in the backyard playing in a sandbox, I believe it was. And his son was, you know, 20, 30 yards off. And the father said to his son, Son! Sit still. Don't move a muscle. Then he began to raise his rifle. And he began to aim it. And from where the little boy said, it pretty much looked like Dad was aiming for him. But he sat there frozen. His dad told him to freeze. He didn't know what his dad was doing. But he had enough confidence in his dad to know he wasn't going to hurt him. And his father stood there for a moment and then he pulled back on that trigger and released the hammer on the rifle and a bullet flew out of that rifle and it went right past that young boy's head and very shortly after that boy it struck a rattlesnake that was sitting right by the box. The child didn't see the rattlesnake but daddy did. That kid could have reacted. He could have said, Daddy's aiming a gun at me. Oh, he's going to shoot me. He could have tried to jump up out of the sandbox and run. And for certain, he'd have gotten bitten by that rattlesnake had he done that. But instead, he listened to what his father told him to do. And he was paralyzed by faith. Hallelujah. He was paralyzed by faith. I know my dad don't ask me to do anything that isn't good for me. I know that dad wouldn't tell me to do this unless it was imperative that I do this and I tell him the truth today. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I wish to God today there were more believers in our world who understood that God is not going to, he come to about a sheep out of a high. It's not going to ask you to go through anything that he's not planning on taking you through. He's not asking you to go anywhere that he's not planning on going there with you. Hallelujah. He's not telling you to go somewhere and I'll meet you after a while. No. If he tells you to go somewhere, you better believe that he is with you as you journey. I want to tell you today, Satan fears the children of God. It should not be the other way around. 
we have the Spirit of Christ within us. When Satan sees the child of God full of the Holy Ghost, let me tell you what the devil sees. He sees Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. He sees the Father. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 28, the Word of the Lord declares, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he, Jesus, went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. The devil's afraid of the Lord. And where Jesus is, the devil is fearful. If Jesus is with you, if Jesus is in you, then you need to learn there's never any need for you to be paralyzed by fear. Hallelujah. If you're paralyzed by anything, you ought to be paralyzed by faith. Hallelujah. You ought to be paralyzed. You ought to be struck into a state of no, of, of no motion, no movement, because of your trust and confidence in God. The word of the Lord said in Acts 19, 13 through 15, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? See, let me tell you something. The devil knows who God's people are. The devil knows who has the Holy Ghost. The devil knows who's walking hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't just a matter of the devil being afraid of the Lord. He's afraid of you and I. He's afraid of the children of God. I've told you the story before. I lived in New York City for 10 years. There were a number of incidents, literally a number of times. I can't even count how many. I, I can't think of them. quite a few. Where I would get on a subway or on a bus or I'd be standing on the street corner and one of the people who were homeless who were wandering around, you know, all of a sudden they look up at me and they would begin to scream at the top of their lungs, leave me alone, leave me alone, I know who you are, I know who you are. I knew a man one time who was literally a priest in a African occult religion. And I knew this. I knew he did this. And we were on a train together and this woman come on the train and she was walking through the car and as she looked at me she began to scream these kind of words. Stay away from me. Don't come near me. I know who you are. I know you. I know you. And she's screaming at the top of her lungs and she ran off into another car. And this gentleman that I knew, he looked at me and he said, I've seen that woman on this train for years. He said, she's ridden this train for years and years. I have never, ever seen her do that. It scared him out of his mind. I'm here to tell you today, children of God, when you let the devil scare you, you are doing yourself and you are living, uh, you are doing the faith of disservice because the enemy ought to be afraid of you, not the other way around. In Mark 16 and verse 17, the Word of God declares, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Hallelujah. The first thing on the list is that the children of God, through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, would have the power to cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. 
In Luke chapter 10, verses 16 through 19, we understand the principle. We understand better why the enemy is so afraid of us. Listen, Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, He that heareth you, heareth me. <laughs> and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. Well, who despises the Lord more than devils and demons? Am I telling the truth? Right. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, listen, over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why are you afraid of this current circumstance? Why are you fearful about what's happening in our world right now? Don't you understand Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God? Don't you understand Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, has invested His power and His authority in every believer? Hallelujah! These signs shall follow them that believe. Hallelujah. He said, nothing. You're going to be able to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And nothing shall by any means harm you. Oh, it's time for God's people to start living like God's people. Walking in the power and in the authority that God has given us. Because if we'll walk in the power and in the authority that God has given us, we will never be paralyzed by fear. But if we're paralyzed at all, it'll be because of faith. It'll be Daddy lifting his gun. And we don't understand what he's aiming at. We're not sure it isn't us he wants to shoot. But it doesn't matter. Because if God is doing it, there is some good purpose yes, to be yeah. had. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verses 14 through 17. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of, Israel, of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow ye go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So I'm going to tell you something. You know, I talked about the fight or flight instinct. God's people are not called to fight. One of the worst things that's come into the New Testament church through the fundamentalist and evangelical nutcases that are out there today is this mentality that we're supposed to fight culture wars and we're supposed to fight political battles and we're supposed to fight this and fight that. That is a lie from the pit of hell, my friend. God never called us to fight. In the New Testament, my God, the teaching of the New Testament is a teaching of peace. The Word of God said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The Word of God declares, love your enemies, pray for them which do 
spitefully use you. The Word of God tells us that when you're smitten on one side of your face, listen to me carefully now, because a lot of people misunderstand this passage. You're to defiantly stand firm and offer the other cheek also. See, a lot of people think that the Lord is telling us we're supposed to be cowards. We're supposed to be wimps. We're supposed to be cheap and cheesy. That's not what Jesus was saying at all. Not even close. I'm going to share a little revelation with you today. The Lord said, if your enemy smites you on one side, turn the other cheek. You've heard the term, turn the other cheek. He said, turn the other cheek. Offer it to him also. In order to do that, that means... You're not allowing his first smite to beat you into submission. Most people, if your enemy smites you, they're going to stay down. They're going to, they're going to show, okay, I give in, I quit. The Lord said, no, 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 no. You stand in your position. Say, okay, you got one side, now here's the other one. Why would you do that? Why does God teach us as children of God not to fight, not to argue, not to debate, not to be embroiled in wars, not to make enemies? Why does He teach us this? Oh, it's very simple, my friend. Because the Word of God also tells us, listen to me now, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I hope you're listening to me, saints. I hope you're hearing what I'm telling you. The Lord said, turn the other cheek. Why did he say turn the other cheek? Oh, how I, ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Because, I'm going to tell you why God said that. He said, because, honey, I'm going to get them. See, you don't need to fight them. You don't need to raise up against them. You don't need to go to war. You don't need to wrestle with your enemy. He said, I'll take care of them. Hallelujah. Nobody touches the apple of my eye. Nobody touches one of my children. Nobody touches one of the people who belong to the kingdom of heaven except that I will visit upon them judgment and retribution. And oh, I want to tell you today, God's retribution is far greater than anything you could ever hand out. The Word of God says, Satan like a roaring lion roameth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And when you hear that old right lion roar, you should be paralyzed. Not paralyzed by fear, but paralyzed by faith. You know why? I hear the lion roar, but I need to stand still. I don't need to move a muscle. Why? Because God is with me. And He has said, I'll take care of it. Hallelujah. Do you hear me today? God says, I'll take care of it. It's not your battle, it's my battle. When somebody comes against one of God's people, it is not the battle that belongs to God's people, it is the battle that belongs to God. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. And the Lord says, all you got to do is what? Stand still. Woo! Be paralyzed by faith. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 13, almost done. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, we're not supposed to fight. We're supposed to stand. The armor that God's given us is He has given us so that no matter what the enemy throws at us, we can continue to stand. Oh my goodness. Got people who claim, well, the Word of God is the two-edged sword. That's given to us to fight. No, it's not. It's given to us to survive, but I'll go into that in a moment. Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. What is God's objective in giving us the whole armor of God? His objective is that we be able to continue to stand. It's not about fighting. It's about being able to stand. Hallelujah. We remain standing. In Romans chapter 8 verses 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Lastly, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Past tense. And have overcome them. See, any enemy that comes your way, you've already won. You've already defeated them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, I want to tell you today, saints. The Bible said when the enemy comes against us like a flood, that our God will raise up a standard against him. And I've talked about this passage in the past. And that literally means that God will cause the ground beneath our feet to rise. The safest way to be safe in a flood is what? To be on higher ground. Amen. Well, that's what God is saying. He said, when the enemy comes against you like a flood, he said, I will cause a mountain to rise up underneath your feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to be on higher ground. That, that attack of the enemy is not going to be able to impact you. It will not be able to affect you. I want you to know today, if you have God in your life and you have God on your side, you can't possibly win. The only, excuse me, you cannot possibly lose. The only way the enemy can win is if you allow fear and unbelief into your life. But God is telling us today, in every circumstance, in every situation, when you hear the howling of the wind, when you see the waves rising high in the air and clapping against the surface of the waters, when the skies grow dark and lightning begins to make its appearance, when you hear the clap of thunder, when you hear the roar of the lion, when the doctor says you've got cancer, when the bank account says you're broke. When your cabinets are empty and you're hungry. When things look their darkest and their bleakest and you feel like the children of Israel pushed up against the bank of the Red Sea with a drowning river before you and armies of enemies behind you. Here's the right response. Be paralyzed by faith. Stand still. Don't move. God knows what He's doing. And as long as you stay out of the way, as long as you trust Him and believe Him, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God's going to take care of your business. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Take God at His word. Believe His promises. Walk in the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost as children of God. And be paralyzed never by anything except by faith. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God. Amen.